All right, hello, we're going to continue with this, the OS dev here. Uh, today, at least partly, I'm hoping to get uh, auto-building the OS done instead of having to manually build it like we do now, we call make. Um, what I mean by manually build is if these sector numbers change, then I have to go in and change them within the file table every time they change, right? At least for the kernel and editor and CAG. Well, really any of these, but I have to change them in here. And then if it's anything particular, particularly important in the boot sector, like the file table, if that were to change, or the kernel or the font, I have to change them in here as well. I don't like doing that. It takes up a lot of time. That could be better, better be spent elsewhere. I could test different compiler or linker flags or things easier because they would end up changing the file sizes if the optimization level changes, if I want to test those things or other things for the future. Just different stuff could happen to where the file sizes will change more often, depending on what I'm doing. And it's really annoying having to go and manually change all those. So firstly, um, auto building the file table itself. So instead of having, you know, this separate assembly file here to hold all this, I'm going to have a, uh, I'm going to have a shell script that'll basically enter all these entries in manually. Well, not manually. It'll, it'll enter all of these in automatically from the make file. So given a file name and given, say, a size, it'll enter in an entry. So it'll enter in bootsect. The file size, it can automatically determine which starting sector it would be. That's the only thing that'll be dynamic here, really. The directory entry right now I'm not using still. That's still zero. But the given a file size and a starting sector, we'll say we'll start at one. Then you just add those two together to get to the next sector and then add the size to get to the next one, add the size, so on. So we can determine that programmatically and just build these entries automatically into, say, file table dot bin, a binary file. Then we don't have to mess with the separate assembly file. We can just construct it on the fly whenever we build. So if I get that done, then I can change the boot sector to take that into consideration and sort of automatically search through the file table and get the sectors that way and then load them from the disk. We'll have a, a little bit different boot sector logic, but it'll be more generic. We won't be hard coding everything every time. So, um, but the make file, there's, there's a few other, you know, streamlined simplifications, refactors I did as well. I got rid of the CC variable, so I'm going to get rid of that because you, it might not be set on yours if you're BSD or Linux, but Generally, there is a CC set. Oh, well, that's blank, but if we look at the version. I'm using Clang by default. I'm on OpenBSD. Anyway, you can have a CC set or you can set it yourself. You know, export. Well, that's the lowercase. You probably want to do the uppercase if you need it set by default. We can do that. And then see what it says. Not C. Clang. Or generally, it might be within parentheses in your shell if you have it. Maybe it's within the other ones. I don't remember exactly if these are going to be set interactively. Yeah. So you can do, you can do, you know, export it, set it yourself, and do it within curly braces, or it's probably already set, and you can check by, you know, checking the version. And CC means C compiler, if nobody knew that, because I didn't. But okay, so I got rid of that. That makes this a little bit more portable. It's not set by default. Although this only builds under Clang, not GCC. That needs other changes for later. So I changed how some of these are set up. The, the C file is going to be the same. The assembly files here, I'm going to get rid of the boot sector and the second stage names because I'm going to build those to start off with. Um, I'm not going to include them here, but they will be down here, which will be good. And then I'm going to rearrange these so that the file table is second in the list. And with that being second, it means it will always be second on the disk and we can, you know, load that to memory and then use it to read through and not have to manually change things later. So this will always be second within the file table now. I'll change that to be set up. Oh, I'm messing everything up today. I want to copy this. <laughs> Paste it there. Get rid of that. That's what I wanted to do. So the assembly files we're going to use are second stage, the test font, then the fonts, basically. Fonts in the second stage, the C files are the same. Um, the purpose of doing that was so that these are basically in that order already, kind of. We can make this a little bit simpler by just referencing those files that we already have laid out. The boot sector, then the file table, then these files. And then after that, in the file table and on the disk, I'll have the C files. So it's kind of laid out, you know, assembly and then C. It'll be the same list, kind of, rearranged as it was before. 
That way this works, we can still concatenate all of them together to make the temp, to make the final OS. Um, some other things I saw were, I tried to build this on another OS, on FreeBSD, maybe on Ubuntu or something, I don't remember, but whatever shell I was using on those other operating systems did not work with this for some reason. It didn't take, you know, any spaces at the start of this variable, get rid of them. That didn't work, but I also learned a little bit more about shell, and there should be default arithmetic expansions, so to speak. So anything within, like, double parentheses should, if it's like arithmetic, if it's like add, subtract, multiply, divide, um, that should be evaluated, you know, with the dollar in front. Um, but that will also sort of get rid of any leading or trailing spaces as well when it determines that, at least leading spaces. So instead of getting rid of spaces at the front like I was doing here, we can instead surround this uh, with another set of parentheses. Well, with double. Double parentheses, specifically. So this was in, a, in effect be, you know, the wc-c file name. You know. But when it gets this result, the number of bytes within the file, it's going to get rid of the leading spaces because it kind of automatically does the arithmetic expansion there, however it was called. So that's a little shorter way of cutting off the leading spaces, so that's good. There's also where I have EXPR for expression. I actually don't need that <laughs> if we do the double parentheses because that's going to automatically evaluate whatever like math operation is within here, so I don't need expression. And this is just, I'm assuming basic POSIX shell, but I think OpenBSD uses KShell 93. It should work in whatever, you know, on a modern system, should be fine. Um, the other thing is some of these dollars I don't need. If we're already going to expand and evaluate what's within these parentheses, I don't need to, you know, specify that this is a variable. It will already kind of know that that's going to be a variable in here. So I don't need those. Yeah, but that's just small, small refactors there. And I'll do the same down here. This size will be prefixed by dollar dollar double parentheses, and then we'll put these over here. So I do still need the dollar sign in front of this because I kind of have to evaluate this expression before I treat it as a sort of math operation or expression that I can evaluate again in order to get rid of the leading spaces. But we can just do that, surround it with double parentheses and the dollars. And then down here again, this can be double parentheses, get rid of the expression and the dollar. And then we will evaluate this again. So double parentheses, get rid of expression, the dollar, surround it with two. And then surround this one with two. So that will evaluate size mod 512 and then size minus that plus that. So that should still work. I don't need this expression or this dollar. No. But I can surround it with two and that'll evaluate. Same thing over here. Surround it with two, but this is part of the printf, so I do need a third one there to go with that. And I think this as well, yeah. To go with that printf. Yeah, in the DD line, we don't need expression, we can do double parentheses. And then with that, we don't need the dollar signs there or there, because they're going to be found as variables. So I also did a slight thing here. I'm just going to separate this out onto multiple lines because we can do other flags on different lines and it'll read a little bit better. So I'll just do that. And if we don't want this move on its own separate line, we can kind of do that here. So bin directory, and then we'll just prefix that wherever this is at. So it'll look at that new location. That's going to be here in the output file, then we don't have to move it. So those are starting changes. I'll see if it still works. Uh, printf expected a value, so that didn't work, obviously. <laughs> but that's okay. Oh yeah, this needs the third parenthesis here for the printf. That might have been that issue. Yeah, that was that issue. Okay, so it makes those, but it doesn't have these files anymore because I took them out. Took them out of the assembly file line here. I just moved them down here. So how am I going to actually build those files? I'll make another make target called like reset or something. Call it reset file table. I'll make another target here, which will be evaluated first. Or it'll be ran first. Reset file table. 
and I'm going to have a, a separate shell script that I'm going to build the file table with. And to keep a running total of um, the only sort of dynamic number that we need is going to be the starting sector here, and it's going to start at 1. Um, to keep a running total within our separate shell script that's going to be called repeatedly for each one of these files that I'm going to build a file table entry for, I need to keep a running total, so I'm going to have a little separate file while we're building that's going to hold that number. So I'm just going to put like a 1 in there to start off. So I don't want to see the output. Echo, do not use a new line at the end. Just output a 1, an ASCII 1. Um, to a file, I'm just going to call it just going to call it sector num. So it's going to hold a running total of whatever this number is, the starting sector. So after each entry is made, it's going, you know, that'll be updated. And what I'm going to do to start off with is build the boot sector, because I don't have it up here. I'm going to send it to a separate file. So I need to build that first, because it's the first thing on the disk. I'm going to do that. That is a capital S. dot asm not bin <laughs> but we're gonna make the dot bin in the bin directory and the output i'm gonna send a dev null i don't want to see it and i'm going to call a new shell script that i'm gonna make which is going to be called add file table entry for simplicity i'm gonna send it the file name without the extension but we'll just call it bootsect um, and I'm going to send the size of the file. So I'm going to be sending this shell script the file name that we're going to make an entry for and the file size. That way it can fill out the info for the name. And the starting sector, it'll add the size to that so that next time we'll have the new starting sector that will be stored within this file here. And then we can keep a running total of that and just build these entries. And then because I'm not... I don't have a, I'm not going to have a separate assembly file for the file table. I'm going to go ahead and just add that to this table as well. Because this shell script is going to make the, the file for the file table. So to add the file table name itself, I'm going to add that here right after the boot sector. So that when it concatenates here later, it's going to be second in the list. It'll be second on the disk. And we can then load starting from the second sector and then load the other ones once we have that info. Um, that'll be within the boot sector later, but I'll just load this first. We'll send it the name. We'll send it the file size. Later, this can be larger than one. But if we're going to build the file table separately, the file table.bin file, then when we actually concatenate it, we'll need the we'll need it to have the right size, and we'll need it to be in the right location. So I'll do that here. I'll set the size again. <laughs> Um, just one for that. WC. So these we're expecting it to be in the bin directory. File table dot bin. Continue to the next line. So that'll get the file size. We'll get the new size again. Should be the old size minus size mod five twelve plus five twelve. Pad it out to the next sector size. Don't need that. And we'll DD it. Dev zero. Output file will be the same file. Yes equals one. Seek will be size. Count will be new size minus size. And we don't want any lines about the status okay that way all of this other stuff here works because we'll have a file table dot bin of the right sector size and then we'll you know it'll be concatenated with the other files here and it'll be correct and that that all will work okay after we get rid of the os dot bin we'll have a, a lingering file for the sector number so i'm just going to get rid of that as well in this build folder we got here i think that's all i'm doing here so i'll go ahead and make the uh the shell script now. So that's add file table entry dot shell is what I called it. Is it crunch bang or is it bang crunch? <laughs> I think it's crunch bang, right? Just going to be doing bin shell. So this should hopefully be POSIX shell compliant. 
So you won't have to worry about what shell you're doing. They'll all support this by default. Not going to add any bashisms or anything. Um, it's going to be auto build file table dot bin. One entry at a time. Or inputs for this. I'm going to have the file name as the first input. The second input will be file size. In sectors. So our whole thing we have here, I'm just going to copy this over so that I don't lose it and forget how things are set up. Make that a comment there. Okay. Change that back. I'll have a few variables here. This is going to be in shell. So the file name is going to be the first input here, um, which in this is going to be $1. Then we'll have file size be the second input, so that'll be $2. And then I'm going to have a variable just to hold the file table name, where the file's at, um, which in relative addressing can be one folder up in the bin folder, file table.bin. This is the file we're going to be building automatically with this shell script. Uh, okay, so to add an entry, I'm going to add the file name first. And I'm going to be using the shell printf, man printf, not the C <laughs> function, but the shell, which works similarly to that, but not the exact same. Um, you can also do echo, but I'm just using, I think printf is supposed to be safer and better than echo for everything. So if I remember, I'll try to use printf for most of these. But the first thing I'm going to do is just output the file name, which we sent first, into this new file that we're going to build. So I'll output that into file table. And ASCII bytes are going to be the same, you know, if they're on, if they're in a, bin, a binary file or a text file. These are just ASCII bytes that we're sending for the file name. Uh, the first ones we're sending, literally the string here is going to say boot sect. That's going to be the first entry. We look at the file. Oh. So the first thing I'm going to write is boot sect. Um, if I just send boot sect and I don't, pad it out to 10, I'm going to have to pad it out to 10 because that's what I'm assuming is the length for all these in my programming. So I'm going to do that. Pad out name to 10 with blanks. So I learned how to do, you know, while loops and stuff in shell. It wasn't too bad um, to get the length of a variable here. You can put dollar curly brace to evaluate and um, a single pound sign, octothorpe, whatever. In front of the variable name, this will give the length of the name. Or length of string, whatever. I'll just put length of variable. So while that's less than 10, I want to pad it out, you know, with blanks. So while we can do single bracket, while I um, dash LT for less than 10. And then you need spaces. Again, spaces before these. And apparently left bracket is its own operator, which evaluates stuff. but. Um, th this is equivalent to an if statement, or a conditional. So while i is less than 10, but we'll have do, later we'll have done. So we'll have a loop going on here. Um, I'm just going to echo a space. I could do printf, but I figure this is less. Um, this should be equivalent, though. If I did printf percent %s in a space, that would probably be equivalent, or percent %c, but whatever. This is fine. We'll echo a space uh, to file table. And that will, you know, while the length is less than 10, we're going to echo a space, and I'll set i to the next. I'll increment it, effectively. Um, again, by doing our shell arithmetic expansion here, so i equals i plus 1. If that's less than 10, we'll put another space, increment it again, so on. And that'll fill out the name. So that'll fill out boot sect and two spaces here. So then we want to get the extension. Um, that's going to be a little more hard-coded here. <laughs> Because I don't have too many different file types. I have, you know, bin, font, text. I only have three right now. It could be more later, but I'm just, for now, I'll do a simple um, case or select statement, a switch here. For the file extension, let's move this up here in case my big old, big old head's in the way. I'll move it up there. 
It's a file extension. I'll do a case statement. So for our file name, if it equals one of these things, the reason I have red on here is I don't know. I don't know whatever the shell uh, file type equals right now. Can I look at that? I don't remember how you look at that, but <laughs> if I just set it to shell, then it doesn't have any syntax highlighting. Not that you need it, but. So if file name equals file table, because right now that is the only thing I set as a text file to start off when I'm building. So basically if the file name equals this, then I'm gonna put text as the extension. If it equals one of these font files, then I'm gonna put FNT as the extension. If it equals anything else, I'm gonna put BIN as the extension. So that's all I'm gonna do here. So if it equals file table, So yeah, I sort of mixed and matched echo and printf. It's a little, it doesn't matter, but it's not consistent. But if it's file table, I'm going to put txt as the next three characters. I think that's a break. If it equals test font or term u16 in or term u18 in, those are my current font files here. Then I'll print out font. And if it equals anything else, which you can get the asterisk in the uh, closing print for that. So if it's anything else, I'm just going to print BIN. And then we'll do ESAC, because that is how you close case. It's backwards. Although do is do and done. It's not OD. I guess because OD is oct octal dump, which is a separate command and program, but whatever. Uh, but after we get directory. After we get the file name and the extension, we'll put directory entry, this number here, which I might not need because I'm not using, but I'll keep it there for argument's sake because it's already there. Good old backwards compatibility for stuff that isn't being used, you know? <laughs> um, but that's just going to be zero for everyone. So how do I put in actual zero bytes? These are in hex. So an actual file table.bin, these need to be the bytes, you know, zero or one. This doesn't need to be the ASCII value of zero and one because that as a number is going to be like, 30 or 31 in hex, right? So I need to get the actual, you know, hex or binary or decimal, these actual numeric bytes into the file. So to do that with printf, you can do a percent %b, which, um, what does that do again? <laughs> it's at the bottom up. So these format specifiers. So b has characters from the string are printed with backslash escape sequences expanded. So what that means, is that if you do something like slash x backslash x zero zero this will count as hexadecimal right if you didn't have this b if you had like percent x it will output the ascii zero zero for hexadecimal and if you put like a and b i think it would be ascii a and b but if you put percent b it evaluates this as the slash x so well sorry if you did slash x and you didn't put this <laughs> or maybe you do put it um, this would be the ASCII AB. If you put plat, uh, percent %B and you do backslash X, this will be evaluated as the hexadecimal AB or decimal uh, 10 and 11, right? If we put 0, 0, then this will actually be the numeric bytes, 0. A full, a full character with just 0 byte. I'm going to output a literal 0, 1 byte value, to the file. So next we'll have the starting sector, which is going to be this number here, the number that we're keeping a running total of in the sector num file. I'm going to calculate that, given our second input to the shell script, the uh, file size. So I'm going to have a sector variable here, uh, which is going to be equal to concatenating that sector num text file that we set up uh, within the make file here. So this, where we create with the single output redirect or greater than sign. So we created that file here. It'll have the value of the ASCII byte one. So I'm just going to read that file to standard out and then we'll capture that within this variable here, sector. And then to convert that to a numeric byte, I'm going to do printf percent %x percent %x sector or I think, yeah, this does make an ASCII output, but I'm just saying whatever 
because I'm storing this as decimal within sector num, it'll be decimal. I'm going to convert that decimal to hexadecimal as a string. I'll do this convert uh, decimal to hex. And then I want to print that as, I want to print those string bytes as numeric bytes. So I got to convert those again, which will be with the percent %b um, slash x. And we can just put that here, dollar sector. Put that into the file table. So we'll take our get decimal string, convert decimal to hex string, output hex string as numeric byte or bytes. So get the ints, or yeah, get the decimal, convert it to hex, output that as the actual hexadecimal numeric bytes. That's what that's doing. And then to update the sector number for the next file table entry, like if we start out at one, um, we need to update it to two, and then we need to update it to six, and then A, right, according to the file size, because we're going to be reading this for every single entry that we get by calling this this shell script. I need to update it, so I'm going to do that. So I'm going to convert it back into decimal because it's easier to work with. But put a 0x on the front. Oh, okay. So if I'm, if I'm converting within printf, if I'm converting a hexadecimal string to a decimal string, I need to put a 0x and then the decimal numbers because this will not have that 0x prefix. It'll just say like ab. And if we want it to be read as hex ab, we have to put the 0x prefix. And then we can convert it to decimal with this percent %d hex string to decimal string. And this might not be the best way of doing this. This is just, I didn't know much shell script, so this is how I ended up doing it. <laughs> um, but to evaluate to get the next starting sector, if we start at one, we need to add one to get two, we need to add four to get six, so on and so forth. To get that next starting sector number, I'm going to you know, evaluate this, this math expression here, sector plus whatever our file size was that was passed in. And if we say, you know, we're reading it as a math expression, so we'll put it within these double parentheses with the dollar sign, which will evaluate that, and it'll set that, you know, sector equal to the result. So I'll do set next starting sector, which will be current plus file size, current sector. Current sector plus the file size will be the next starting sector. And then I'm going to put that back in the file, our sector num file, by just overriding it. So override it with uh, the next sector number. So it starts out at one. We'll get the next one by adding the file size. For boot sector, the file size is one. We'll add these to get two. And I'm going to write that two to the file. So next time this is going to be called with the file table, we'll read in a two. We'll have the size be four. This will be changed. <laughs> Sorry. This 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 will effectively be up here later on. But for the sake of example, um, I'll say if if we were to read in the second stage next, then the file size will be four. This will be two. It'll add and put six. Put that back into here for next time. So, but this won't look like this. This will be rearranged. After that, the last byte. And the entry is going to be the file size and sectors, which we had passed in as the second argument, but it'll be this number. Um, so the file size I'm going to set, even though I have it set up here, it's in ASCII bytes, I need to get it as numeric. So we'll evaluate printf again, percent %d, no, sorry, percent %x. <laughs> Um, itself. Percent x as itself. So it comes in as decimal. It will come in as decimal. So we'll, we'll convert that to a hexadecimal string. Uh, okay. And then to print that as actual numeric bytes, again, we'll do the percent b with the backslash x to evaluate it as hexadecimal, but it'll be numeric, not ASCII. Well, ASCII is numeric, but you know what I mean. <laughs> And we'll concatenate that to the end of the file table, wherever we're at. That is all this file is going to do. 
So we will take in a file name and a size. We'll write to this file here, concatenate onto the end of it, append to it. Uh, the next file name, pad it out to 10 if need be, then we'll put the extension in, then we'll put the directory entry as numeric bytes. We'll get the starting sector and the file size, and we'll be setting the next starting sector for the next time we call this file. So that is the whole shell script here, if that makes a little lick of sense. Oh, we don't have it, that's good. Now why is that? We do have it, but I need to chmod it. Forgot about that. Make it executable. Unless I didn't call it that. Add file table, oh, I did dot entry, yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's not do that. This needs to be underscore. But it will be executable, so that's good. Just want to see if this does anything. There we go. We call it, we make it. This won't work currently. It's not going to boot because we haven't changed the boot sector to account for that. But we do have the different, um, you know, files here. We have the assembly files and the C files. And if we want to look at that, I'll do a hex dump. 1024 length because the file table is going to be the second sector, 512 bytes on the disk. And we'll look at that. Um, and I guess it did not build correctly because we only have these two. And that is true because I'm not calling it for the other ones. Sorry. <laughs> I got to call this, this line here. I got to call this for all the other files that we build. That is what I forgot to do. Okay. So for the assembly file, if we want to build that into the file table, we'll just add a record here. What file name are we going to call to add the entry for? It's going to be dollar at. When we call these, the dollar at will correspond to the assembly file variable, which is going to be these file names. Same thing for C files. If we do that for C, it'll be kernel, then editor, then calculator, because it'll call it in order. Um, and the file size we're going to send, okay, is going to be not size, but size divided by 512, because it'll be in sectors. So we'll evaluate an expression for size divided by 512, which I could make instead of having to do it twice. I could just set it once and then, but it, it, it's whatever. This is fine. We'll do that. And same for the C files down here. We'll do dollar add, except the C files will not be on a sector boundary by default. That's why I have this different new size variable. So instead of size 512, this will be new size over 512. Also, don't need those dollars, um, but the other ones I do. Okay, this will be new size over 512 to get to the, the corrected, the updated sector size for the C file, but the assembly file is already one sector on, at the set boundary every time, so it just needs the regular one. Uh, but okay, that'll call the shell script with the name, dollar at, and the size, and that should work. So if I look at the OS bin again, we should see a uh, boot sec file table, then we should see these names and then these names, and it should have the correct bytes. So there we go. So this is the second sector after one F zero, starting at 200, which is 512. We have boot sec, space, space, padded out to 10, then we have BIN, then we have the directory entry of zero, then we have the, the starting sector and the file size. And then these are added to get a two for the next starting sector, and then the size for file table, three. These are not correct, though. These should not be zero. <laughs> so that's not correct. The file size is not coming over correctly. It should be, but it wasn't. Those are both one. This should be size over 512. Let's not delete that and see what happens. As a three. So these two go through and it's updated correctly, but then when we do anything else, it is not. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Here we have these lines. This needs to be continued. Sorry. <laughs> Took me way too long to find this. When I'm getting the size and I'm using the size within this echo statement, that's fine, but I need to keep the size variable going to the next line. So I need to continue the line here with a semicolon and a backslash. I don't need that then. I need the size variable here. I get it here. So all these lines need to be 
sort of continued, so they're all evaluated in one subshell or whatever makefile calls it. The same thing for C here. This line continues to this echo, which then continues down here, but I use the size here, so I need to also continue this down here. Okay, that should work. <laughs> press it one, it pressed it twice, that's, yeah. Colon not found, um, it says empty. Empty is not found, interesting. Okay, you cannot have, <laughs> you cannot have an extra character right here. If I have a space here, if I put a space there, this is not valid. It says it's searching for a space. So this backslash has to be the actual end of the line here. Let's make sure those are all correct. Little things like that are very annoying, but now it goes all the way through. Um... And we still have sector num, 97, okay. So if I search, if we bring back the XXD, now these should be correct. <laughs> boot sect, one, one, two, one for the file table. It did boot sect again, which is not good, and file table again. Probably because I uh, messed up making it and did it twice. So if we have a clean slate, then we're good. Bootsec file table. Second stage is three, goes for four, which makes seven. Test font is four. So seven plus four is 11, which is B plus four. It's 15, which is F plus nine, 24. So 16 plus eight. So that's right. And then plus 31. I'm assuming this is correct. And then these are correct. Of course, we can check because they should be the same size as we had before. Get my screenshot tool on. Let's copy that. These are zero, one, one. Uh, zero, two. Oh yeah, file. Well, yeah, these will be different. Yep, file table is only one sector, and that's second now. So that's why second stage is four. Term u sixteen. Term u eighteen is nine. Kernel is one f. That is correct. Editors 1D, calculator 0D. So those should be correct. 54 plus D should be the same as 5D plus 4. <laughs> so 54 plus 12 is 61. 5D plus 4 is 61. So those are correct. They end up in the same place. They're just rearranged. Um, but okay, so we, we automatically build the file table.bin file now with that shell script, which is good. If we want to add more files later, we can just add them here to C files or assembly files, and it'll still work because the first two files in there are going to explicitly be the boot sector and the file table by setting them up here. And since we get the size, it'll have the correct size and starting sector, so we're good to go. We auto build it. I'll remove this as well. Okay, but to actually use our new file table layout, Ideally, search through the file table automatically and load stuff without having hard code sectors in the boot sector. The boot sector will have to change, so I'm going to do that next. Okay, so to continue with this, uh, the, to change the boot sector here, it says bootloader. The boot sector here to change this uh, to correspond with the changes in the make file for auto building everything into the, the file table.bin, we have to read that new file table.bin, which is going to be set at the second sector on the disk every time. So to make those changes to be able to read from that at that new location, we have to change the boot sector. So that's what I'm going to do here. Previously, we had the file table in memory second. That's going to be first now. This will look a little bit different, but I'll just move it there. Bootloader will be second. File table is going to be first. Sector number two. Start reading at sector two. We'll only read one for now, one sector, but I'm going to go ahead and sort of lay out everything, even though, you know, this stuff's already down here. I'm going to put this up here, sort of hard coded to begin with. But the only hard coding for sectors and things is really just going to be for the file table. We're going to load one sector from the second sector on the disk for the file table. Eventually, if it's greater than one sector, then at that point we can 
you know, just do what I'm going to do to dynamically load the other stuff. But we can call that for the file table again um, in case it's more than one sector and we have to load more sectors later. That's fine. Uh, but to start out, I'm just going to, you know, put all this stuff here that's going to be done anyway for the other bootloader and kernel and things. I'm going to lay it out here. So the head and drive number, yeah, it's going to be one. Uh, or the hard disk. Hard disk is the first one. It should be 80, but that's fine. Hex 80. Head number, we're going to end. This, this is going to be the same. Cylinder low and high are going to be zero. I don't think I have to reset AL since I already do. Well, for the second one, I think I can just do that. We'll find out. Uh, command port read with retry. And then we'll go ahead and call load sectors. That's fine. Um, load sectors will change a bit. And I'm going to have a another additional sort of subroutine to find a file table entry within the file table, since it's now guaranteed to always be at the second sector on the disk. Um, and it will be loaded to 1000 and hex is the address. Then we can always search from this address at the moment, unless it changes later. Search for, you know, the file table entry like we do in the kernel and everything at runtime. Uh, so I'm going to put that in before I do the other few changes. I'll put it below here. The subroutine to load a, or to point to, get a file table entry from the file table. I'll just call it that. So as input for this, I'll just have one input really. But SI will point to the name that we're going to search for. And as output, I'm going to have SI point to the file table entry that we find. Points to the file table entry or start. Do start of the file table entry for given file name. Now I'm only going to be loading things I know are in the file table, so this won't have the possibility to be zero or something weird. I'll lay out a couple a couple labels for things that we're going to search for and find. So I'm just going to call it like, I don't need to suffix with string, but that's fine. Bootloader string for the bootloader and the one for the kernel, one for the font file we want to load to start off. The bootloader, the name of that file is second stage, right? Yeah. And if I want to just check for 10 characters at a time, we can pad it out to 10. I'll make one for the kernel as well. Kernel is six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And one for the font that we want to load. Term U 18N. Scatterbrand. I'll have a couple variables that we're going to use later as well for the cylinder head and the sector. Just because we'll be loading stuff from disk and CHS, even though I need to switch to LBA, logical block addressing, which isn't hard. It would just be mainly changing the, the starting sector number in the file table to a LBA number, which is fairly closely related. There's easy um, equations to convert between CHS and LBA. I just, I'll do it later because I'm lazy right now. But I'll have a couple things here for cylinder head and sector. I do want to switch the LBA, just not at the moment. Uh, cylinder can be 0 to 1023 usually, although it could be higher. But we'll just make it a word. Head can be 0 to 15. Sector can be 1 to 63. But that has nothing to do with getting the file table entry. That's just for later. So the file table entry here get entry or whatever I want to call it. Get file table entry, that's... Um, we are guaranteeing that's going to be at 1000 in memory, so I'll just go ahead and do that to start off with. Address of file table, you know, I could just make these like defines up here as well. That would probably be good. Let's do that. Do address, although that's a long word, that's fine. Do EQU 1000 or 1000 and H. I should be able to do that, hopefully, all caps, so I know it's a constant. So how are we going to search for these names? I'm going to have a basic loop here. Um, later we'll want a return, so I'm going to have a return label as well. Um, but for each loop iteration, I'm going to be messing with DI and SI. I'm going to be searching if we have basically these bytes at wherever we're at in the file table, so starting at 1000. If we're searching for the bootloader and we find this text string at whatever DI is pointing to, then we found the file table entry. Um, and if we haven't found it, then we're going to go 16 bytes 
forward and search for that text string again, because they're all going to be 16 bytes apart for each entry length in the table. But each name can be a maximum of 10 characters right now. So I'm just going to have this be 10, search for 10 characters at a time. So I'm going to move CL 10. Um, I'm going to be messing with DI and SI, so I'm going to push those. We want SI to be the file name to search for, so let's set that up to begin with, if I'm going to be doing this stuff. The bootloader, this stuff might change, but let's just assume that we're going to search for this here. Do to do, this will change as well. But, um... So let's just assume we're going to look for the bootloader. So I'll move bootloader string to SI here. Then we'll call get file table entry. And then on return, SI will point to, you know, the correct entry there. So if SI equals the second stage, we want to search for this text string within the file table. So I'm going to push DI and SI. I'm going to compare string byte um, repeatedly. CMP. <laughs> this will compare 10 bytes from the data at SI to the data at DI and increment both. And at the end of that 10 byte comparison, as long as they're equal, it'll keep comparing. But at the end of that, the zero flag will still be set if they're still equal. So if we're equal, then we found that entry, all 10 bytes, wherever DI is pointing to equal, you know, whatever the string is that SI is pointing to. And so if it is equal, we found it and we found the, the entry. I'm going to go to return and we'll return down here. Uh, but if it's not equal, then I'll pop SI and pop DI. And I also want to do that down here so it's equal and we don't have stack mishaps. Um, and then I will add DI 16 so we can go to the next entry. Point to next file table entry. And then we'll just go to the loop again. We'll see if we have matched the bytes or not, because SI was popped. It is reset to whatever the string was. Once we find the string that we're looking for, we found the entry, we'll go to return. But what I'm also going to do is set SI to that entry for later. So I'm going to move into SI the value at DI, which will be the start of the address to this file table entry. But that is all that this is going to do. Set SI to the entry. Okay, so if we go up here and we do that, we call the bootloader string. So after this SI, after this call, SI will point to the right entry for whatever file name was in this string. So I'm going to change load sectors a bit, this. I'm gonna change this subroutine a bit now. Um, I'm gonna have it assume that DI is pointing to the memory that we wanna load something to. So, well, same as it already is. We're moving di here, the address. Um, so I'll do this, and we'll call load sectors. So this will only assume that di is going to have this, and then si will point to the file table entry. But I'll make those changes here to this subroutine. I'm going to add them here formally, so I don't forget later. I points to address. To load sectors two. We'll have SI points to file table entry. Okay, outputs. And I'm not going to have any outputs, but I'll put note. I'm going to put typical disk limits. This is kind of how it originally was. So these aren't really true. A lot of platforms have greater cylinder limits than 1023, for example, and greater sector limits. Some have 255, I think. Although usually 1 to 63 is, is what happens. But I'll just put typical. I'll put it in double quotes. Cylinder 0 to 123, 1,023 rather, head 0 to 15, and sector 1 to 63, one based, because I'll forget if I don't do that. i got to see what I changed. Okay, so first off in here, I'm going to change this to um, get the correct CHS values from given starting sector and file table entry. Okay. So if we're given a starting sector that's like 100 something or 200 something or what have you, 
I want to convert that into the correct CHS values. Now right now cylinder is only ever going to be zero because my starting sector is limited to one byte in the file table. So links and things will have to change later, but I can at least right now make this code generic to where it's one less place to change stuff later. <laughs> if we're given a sector number that's like this file starts at sector 128 or something, that's not going to be sector 128. We have to convert it between 1 and 63 and the head has to go up. Cylinder would be zero, but sector 63 would be on head zero, for example. Sector 64 would be sector one on head one. And then you add 63 and you'd get um, sector one on head two, for example. So I'll have a little formula here, a little algorithm to determine these, these values. Um, for whatever we're doing, I'm going to first initialize these to zero though. So a little bit of a wasted bytes because I'm using memory addresses, but we have bytes to spare right now. So that's okay. Let's be head, let's be sector. We'll reset these. And to get the starting sector, that is at the file table entry plus 14 bytes. 15 is the size in sectors, 14 is the starting sector. So we'll do that here. And just to start it off, we'll move. Um, I'm going to change this to start sector because that's what I had in my notes. So this will be start sector, not sector. Sorry about that, but that's the only thing I'm going to be changing there. Start sector. Okay. So we'll move that byte value into there just to initialize it to start off. So to get the correct values, I'm going to compare AL to 63 because that is the sector limit. One to 63. And if it's less than or equal to 63, then we're good. The cylinder and head will be zero. The start sector will be set. We're good to go. If it's greater than 63, we have to convert and change some values. So I'm putting jump less than equal. I'm going to have a label and just go on or something. I'll put it here. We'll go on. Sector is less than or equal 63. Good to go. Otherwise, we need to convert. So I'm going to XOR AH just in case it isn't already. We're going to move 63 to BL. Uh, and I'm going to divide by BL. So I need the value. If I divide by an immediate byte, it has to be within a register. So I'm using BL for that. And this will be, you know, AL divided by 63, or sector. Starting sector divided by 63. AH will equal the remainder. Sector mod 63. AL equals the quotient, which will be sector divided by 63. And we'll be using the mod 63 for the like the head value or the sector value and things. So um, and then I'll compare to zero. So this will make more sense when the rest of the code is typed out, but I want to uh <laughs> Uh, the sec if the sector is above 63, I'm going to set it equal to itself modulo 63. So if it's at 64, it'll be set to 1, for example, and then we'd want to increment the head number to 1. So that's why I'm setting, I'm going to set the sector to itself mod 63 here, but if it is divisible, if the sector is a factor or whatever, if 63 is a factor of the sector, is that how you say that? If, if the sector number is divisible exactly by 63, it'll be 0. And if it is zero, then I'm going to reset it to 63 and decrement the head number. So if we have sector 64, sector will become one and we want to increment the head number. But if the sector is 63, then I'm going to decrement the head number for whatever it is at later. Um, this would make more sense if I wrote out the formula, wouldn't it? Sector mod 63 equals zero. It's not equal to zero, we'll get the cylinder number. I'll have that down here. Otherwise, we're gonna get the head number, but I'm gonna reset this to 63. And decrement AL, which AL was sector divided by 63, which will be the head number later. Head number. Okay, to determine the cylinder, we'll have gotten the right starting sector here from AH. Let me put this here. Um, 
sector equals sector mod 63 if zero and sector is at 63 which is last sector on a head number head equals sector divided by 63 if sector mod 63 and decrement by one cylinder will equal head divided by 16 okay and then the head will equal itself mod 16 I don't know, algorithm formula, whatever you want to call it. It'll be this. If that makes sense. So if we had sector 64, this sector would be 1. Uh, 64 divided by 63 would be 1. So that would, that would be correct. But if we had sector equal to 63, then 63 mod 63 would be 0. Sector divided by 63, if it was 63, this would be 1. But the head of the head value 1 wouldn't be correct because sector 63 would be 63 on head 0. So that's why if modulo, if the sector modulo 63 is 0, then head from this would be 1 and we want to decrement it by 1. So it kind of corrects the, the last sector on a head issue. And once we have that head number, it could be greater than 15, but I'm just going to do cylinder as head divided by 16. And then to correct the head number if need be, I'll do head modulo 16. So if the head number was 16, it'll be 0. Because head can only be 0 to 15. If it was 0 to 15, then that's fine, because that will be the same value after this. But if it was 16, the cylinder would be 1, head would be 0. If it was 17, cylinder would be 1, head would be 2, and so on and so forth. That just corrects that and makes that stuff work. So hopefully that makes sense. That's all that's doing. And then I'm just kind of laying that out down here. I should have explained that earlier. Sorry about that. But um, that's that's what I've been doing here. So we'll reset it. We'll decrement if need be. That's okay. We'll set the starting sector. I'll move into the head, the AL. Um, no, after I have the correct head number. <laughs> uh, AH equals sector number. AL equals head number just so I don't forget. Okay, so after we move that over, we can reset AH again and move BL16 so we can divide by that. Head divided by 16. AH equals head modulo 16, which is the remainder. AL will equal head divided by 16. So at that point, we'll have the cylinder number of AL. The cylinder will equal head divided by 16. And then the head will equal head mod 16. So then we can move that over. OK, so we can set those values in case we want to use them later. What I also should do with this is check for like disk limits. The error, if we want to load something that's way out and takes up too much space, um, in which case the cylinder would be greater than its maximum value of 1023, but that'll be something for later. I'll do check for over disk limits, cylinder greater than 1023. That'll be sometime later, or we'll switch to LBA and it won't be an issue. But this will set the correct starting sector cylinder and head number that we can then use to load from the disk. And uh, so we got the starting sector number from the file table entry. We also have the file size at SI plus 15, which is the last byte in the file table entry. And we have the correct CHS values to load. So we got those sort of dynamically, if that makes sense. We search the file table for the right value, or for the right entry, which contains the right values that we can use to load from the disk. So that's what I'm going to do. So the, the only things that we were using before that we need were pretty much the number of sectors that we're going to read in BL, number of sector minus one in BL, and then the address in DI. So I'm still going to assume those things. 
but I'm going to set BL here explicitly. So the number of sectors to read is going to be an SI plus 15. And I'm going to keep that in AL for later, but I'm also going to move that into BL. And also decrement. BL equals sectors minus 1 for disk reading logic. For disk reading logic later. File size and sectors. So for the sector count port, which is 1F2, that I don't have laid out here. F2H sector count. Um, the number of sectors we want to read goes to the sector count port, and that is an AL, because I loaded it here, so we'll do that. And then the sector number port is in 1F3. Be the sector number port, or the sector we need to start reading at which is going to be within the start sector memory that we just filled out up here, the correct number to start reading at, the correct head and cylinder. So we'll output that. Then we can go ahead and do the other ones. Because um, we did 1F2, 1F3, we can fill out 4, 5, 6, and 7 here. So 6, again, is the head number, head and drive number port. So what, what we can really do is just... Make the default the first one here. And then we can OR AL with the head number. So I know I was doing the drive number before. The drive number is probably going to be 80 in hex. Or 8 and 0 if you spell out the nibbles, which would be 1s and 3 zeros and then 4 zeros. So all that really does is setting the top bit, if I'm doing this right. <laughs> Um, so we can just OR with the correct head number, which will be in the low four bits. So the low four bits can be 0 to 15 for the head number. So if we just assume the top bit's going to be set anyway, which it is for A, because A is at least 8, um, it's 10. 10 is greater than 8. So A is going to be 1010 for 10. And then we can OR it with our head number 0 to 15. And that'll get the correct byte that we have to send to this port. Set low nibble to head number 0 to 15. We'll send that. And then we have the two cylinder ports, if that makes more sense now, because cylinder can hold up to 1023. It's a word value, so you have to send two bytes to two ports. Um, except this will be moving the cylinder itself, which will be an AX because it's a word value. So we'll get the cylinder. The low byte is going to be an AL. Since we moved a word and it's a little Indian architecture, the low byte will be an AL, the high byte will be an AH. So we just move the low byte. And then we can move the high byte to the high port. Cylinder low byte is an AL. Okay, and the high byte is going to be an AH just from how little Indian works, and we'll output that. In command port, read with retry, that's fine. Um, for load sectors, uh, I'm gonna rename this to not be a local label, and it's gonna be load sector loop. And the sole purpose of doing that is that 1F2 through 7 were set for the file table here, hard-coded if you will. So instead of calling load sectors, we don't want to set those again because we just set them here. I'm going to call load sector loop instead. Only for the file table because we already we're setting these explicitly to start off. All the other ones can use our get file table entry, this new subroutine, and then call it normally to fill out those ports. But I'm filling out the ports here explicitly just for the file table to set everything off. You might not have to do this. You can probably write it better, but this is what I did. So bear with it. And that would be the change this to do. So we'll just call the loop, which will start looping and loading to memory. From this read with retry, um, it'll load to this address. It'll load basically one sector. I XORed BL to set it to zero. Let's just see. I'll just verify. I don't think I have to change this stuff down here, but I'll just verify. Um, other than this local label here load sector loop, so 
yeah, we'll read from 1F7, see if the top bit is set by bit three, right? Or bit two, zero, one, two, three, bit three. <laughs> if it's set, then it requires servicing, which just means you gotta wait a bit till it's not set anymore. And then we're good, it'll be ready. We'll load 256 words, so 512 bytes, one sector from this data port into whatever DI is set to. File table would be 1000. Boot sector, will set it to 7E00, so on and so forth. Then we'll read from the alternate status register for some sort of 400 nanosecond delay. If BL is zero, we don't need to read because I'm keeping that as the sector number. Sector number to still read, whatever that makes sense. The sectors we still got to read from. So if we're done reading, we'll return. If not, then we'll keep going on. Decrement, reset it, load the next one. So we did add more code, but we can simplify these other things now starting after the file table. So the second stage bootloader, we'll load the file name, we'll get the entry, we have where we want to load it to, and by calling load sectors now, it'll fill out those ports sort of dynamically because it'll get the right starting sector number from the entry in SI, and it'll get the right CHS values, and it'll load to the memory address that we set here. So we don't have to do this stuff anymore. And the kernel, same thing, we can fill out BL, or no, no I don't. No, because that's filled out in load sectors now. Yeah, because we got the file size right here, and we fill BL out, we fill BL out right there. So all we have to do for these is just call get file table entry and what address we wanna load those sectors to, and then call load sectors. So all we need here is DI2000. Um, I'll load this with kernel string, load SI with kernel string, get the file table entry, set DI2000, and then call load sectors. So even though we had more code, this will be, if we want to load other stuff later, it'll be less work. And also it's all sort of dynamic other than the first hard-coded file table values here. So that was the main purpose of doing this. Font will be at A000. SI, we'll put in the font string and call get file table entry. Okay, and then yeah, we can still do this normally. This should work still. Okay, but it should be dynamic now. Hopefully things work, although I probably messed something up. Um, but these strings I think were called correctly. These will be set. So let's see. It made the boot sector all right, or we would have gotten an error. This is all set, 1F1D, 0D. I can make sure, I know I checked this last time, I don't have to do this, but just to make sure these are set up, and they are. So it should call, it should get the second stage at sector three, it should get the number sectors four, it should get term U18 at starting at F and getting nine sectors. Kernel should be at 18 for 1F sector, so hopefully that works. So the boot sector did work because we went to the second stage. It gives us the, you know, the prompt to enter in the values. You can do 100 by 600, 15 bits, it's fine. And everything loaded, the kernel loaded. So we can now dynamically build and run the OS. There are other bugs that I noticed as well. There's a little black line here if you can't see it. Um, it has to do with my printing that I thought was right, but is a little off, of course, in less than 32 bit per pixel modes, but that's okay. I can fix that pretty easy, but the main thing is this dynamically and automatically builds, which is good. So one reason I wanted to do that was to mess with different like compiler flags and stuff just to see what happens. I know GCC doesn't have O of Z, it has OS as the size optimize only, so. I'll change this to O of S for slightly more portability, but that will make these sectors change. You know, these numbers are now a bit bigger than they were, but it shouldn't matter that they're larger now because we automatically build the file table with whatever these values are. So we should still be able to make and make run, build and load, and everything just works still. So that's good. So now it does not matter what these sector numbers are. We don't have to change them anymore. It's, it's automatically taken care of. Um, some other issues were actually loading programs after I did this, though. So let's see. 
if we can load. So we can load. That's good. I know I tried this on, on FreeBSD and loading programs didn't work until I make other changes. So I just wanted to make sure that was there first. We can try something wild like O of 1 or O of 2, which I think will make these even bigger, a lot bigger, because it's taken a while. So 64 sectors is huge. And that doesn't work anymore. Yep. <laughs> which is funny. Um, uh, but I'll stick with O of S right now. No, it wouldn't because the kernel would be at some like large percentage, some large area. Oh, don't hate me for using Windows Calc, but it's just what I'm used to. Uh, <laughs> 64 in hex is 101. Ooh. Times 512. So CA00. Since the kernel starts at 2000, it's going from 2000 to EA, which overwrites everything else, so stuff doesn't work. So if I wanted to load with like O of 2 and have the kernel be 64 sectors, I would have to move it around in memory. So I'm going to do that just to have it work a little bit better. I'm going to move it to some high location like 50,000. So the kernel is going to be at 50,000 now in memory. Um, the other ones I shouldn't have to change. These should still be fine because they don't have a set location set. So to load the kernel at 50,000, uh, we'll load it to five instead. Actually, what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do is mess with ES for this. So basically set ES to 5,000, or well. ES to, will be 5,000, it'll point to 50,000 because segment addressing in 16-bit real mode is fun. <laughs> and actually I'll XOR DI. So read sectors into will be 5,000 zero, which will be 50,000 in hex. Okay. And then we'll call load sectors. And after that, I'll pop ES back to not mess anything up. I think that was the last thing I had to do for that. And the boot sector that is. I don't think I have to mess with this other, well, this stuff should be okay. Um, Second stage, I'll have to change the bootloader, that is, will change at the end where it jumps to. The jump target here will be 50,000 now. Yeah, and this offset will work. That'll be fine. So it's at 50,000. So this should make it, right now I'm testing with OS, right? Dash OS for the optimization flag just to ensure it works. And it does. And I can, we can load uh, the calculator and stuff. Okay, but if I make this O of 2, or dash O2, just to ensure this works with more than one <laughs> optimization flag set for the compiler, so it's more generic, more, uh, I don't know, portable hopefully in the future. This does work, so that's good. Can I still call these other things? I cannot. So the calculator and the other stuff doesn't work anymore. But for some reason, I found that adding position independent executable, not code, not PIC, not lowercase PIC, which is different than capital PIC for whatever reason, and not lowercase PIE, but uppercase PIE, <laughs> position independent executable code. Well, position independent executable, which includes some PIC. This is meant for shared libraries, but for whatever reason, the, the void pointer thing that I sort of make and execute on the fly within the kernel to load things, to load programs like the calculator, like the editor. Here, this stuff right here. So this, for whatever reason, doesn't work now unless, well, at certain optimization levels like dash O2, it doesn't work unless I make it dash FPIE. For some reason, I think that changes this from absolute addressing to program counter relative somehow or makes it makes it a relative address somehow and it and it works so i don't know exactly how it does i should look at disassembly and debug and stuff more but i tried looking at disassembly and it was it was very painful and i couldn't exactly figure out what was going on but that's not the point uh the point is which the fpie i think it'll work i'm at least hoping it will 
in case I want this to run potentially on more things and to work on more systems. It would help not having to have a set optimization flag because that could break between compiler versions and other things. So if I have it sort of more generic to where it works on more things, then hopefully it's good. Um, and it's not because this doesn't work still, which is great. So I'll have to figure out why that doesn't work. It causes an exception. <laughs> no error code. I know that happened on some of these, but not others. Actually, it might have been O2 that was broken. Well, I mean, it is broken. I think it was O2 and O0 that were broken when I was testing. But of course, it'll change right now as I'm talking, right? Because why would it work? Yeah, so O of 0 just skips it completely. It tries to load it like a text file for memory. Uh, o of 2 is broken, as you just saw. O of S did seem to work, but I'll just do that again to make sure. Load the calculator. So O of S works. That's good. You can try O of 1. Hopefully it works on more than just O of S. That would be good. Just load something. No, it doesn't. Oh, well, I'll have some more work to do. <laughs> Which is very unfortunate. I did get it to work with other flags before. I just have to work on that some more. I'll get back when I do. Uh, when I do get it to work. And the important thing is eventually we do want it to work on those other things. Before I feel like FPIE works, but I'll mess with that some more. Um, but the important thing is, is that we can automatically build, and no matter what the sector sizes are, it'll load it from the disk, and we'll be good to go. Actually, you know what it is. You know what I think that is, is that I have code in the file ops file. I just remembered this, you know, which assumes certain numbers here. <laughs> the code in the file ops file does not necessarily load things correctly. I'm giving it a starting sector and a cylinder and a head number, but I'm not messing with those to correct them like I am now in the boot sector. So. Maybe what I can do is make that code within here as well and sort of abstract these functions and make them smaller. That would be good. I might do that. I can do that next. Okay, so I'm in the, the file ops, that H file here. I am going to refactor some of these disk functions to make them a little bit smaller and abstract the disk reading and writing logic, which is pretty much the same between, you know, delete, load, rename, save whatever functions I have in here for messing with disk sectors. Um, before I do any of those refactors though, I do have this to start off with the sort of forward declaration for the check file name function at the top. That's all the way at the bottom here. This this thing, I'm just going to move this to the top uh, just to get rid of that forward declaration because it'll work equivalently and the, everything else down here kind of relies on using this function so it makes a little bit more sense. Flows a little better if that's just to start off with. No extra lines on the bottom. Okay. So I'll just move this up here, but there is also a little bit of a bug with this in that if two file names have the same prefix and you're only searching for like a prefix for a file name and not the full name, um, it'll probably just take the first file it finds within the file table and that can be an issue. So right now, I go in, do uh, whatever. If we're looking for something like these term files or test font, let's, um, I'll make a quick file here. Uh, RR, sure. R, it's a pirate file. <laughs> um, we have test file 01 that I just made, which is going to be effectively a text file and test font. So these things both start with test, right? So if I do something like delete, test F, which isn't even a full name. Um, I know I don't have error return messages or anything, but if I do that, it's going to delete test font because it starts with that test F sort of prefix. And that's not a good thing. <laughs> if I go to delete a file name, I mean, I'm not, I don't have like wildcards or file globbing or whatever that's called. So I, I really don't, you know, want to delete everything with that or even the first thing. I kind of just want to delete a file if I type out the whole name. You know, like if I did that and delete the full file name, that's fine. But we did not want to delete the first one, which is the test F. So 
I kind of need to fix that. That's a bug. So I'm going to do that. And that mostly comes from the file name search here. This returns uh, true effectively. It returns the file table entry with the name that you're searching for. I'm not inputting a pointer into this anymore. Um, but this only works up until whatever you pass in is found. And that doesn't correspond to the full name in all situations here. So if we pass in a length of like 5 for test F and we pass in test F, it's going to search up to 5 as long as these match. And that will return true. This does equal the name, so it's going to you know return the pointer. So I don't want to do that. Uh, so what I'm going to do instead is only break if we match the length or... Well, if we match the length and the character right after this is a space, because right now I'm padding out all the names with spaces to 10, which is the max length for a name. Um, so if the character um, at i plus 1 is a space, then we're okay. Um, or I can say if i equals whatever our maximum length for a name is. So I'll say if, if we have the length and we reach the space, uh, or we've reached the maximum length for a name, and I'll make some like defined or something up here. Uh, max file name length, uh, that'll be 10, that's fine. Because then there won't be anything next to it but the extension. The extension's not guaranteed to be a space, so that's why I have this or here. Or we matched what we entered in, but it's less than the maximum length, um, but the next one's a space. I guess I can put less than or equal. No, we don't want to do less than. If it matches what we put in, then we'll break and we'll return. Otherwise, we'll add 16 and, and check again. So we'll do that. This is still an empty loop that's checking. An empty loop body, that's why there's a semicolon here. It might be easier to read if I put that there. So you can signify, hey, this, you know, is a valid loop, but the, the loop body is, is empty. Um, but I'll change it to that. So just a little quick change there for that extra condition. And we'll see if that fixes that bug, which I hope it will. I think it will. Let's make a, a test file again. All right, the so test file one. So if we go to delete test F, this should not delete anything because it is not the full length of a name. But these both, these are both still there, so that's good. If we do delete test file one, it should delete this whole thing, but I'll just check again. Delete test file should not have deleted anything. So if we delete test file one, it did delete it, so that's good. That might have also affected rename and stuff before. If we try rename test F, test F1, that shouldn't have renamed anything. But if we rename test font, test font 1, then it found it and it renamed it, so that's good. Okay, so that was a little bug, so I think I fixed that, which is, which is nice, but I'll, I'll get to actually refactoring things. That was just something I noticed before I started recording, and I wanted to get that done when I remembered, so or while I remembered, uh, but okay. So effectively all these disk functions do similar code. They search the file table, they get the sectors and the size, and then, you know, they go through and load uh, for reading or writing. And whatever is reading has the same code, whatever is writing has the same code as far as these loops and everything are concerned. The only thing that might change is the address um, and some other smaller things, but I'll have an extra function here to try and abstract that code into the reading and writing sector parts. And I'm also going to have a couple more defines or an enum maybe. Oh, I, can, I can make them defines. They're just going to be text replacement. That's fine. Um, or we can try, well, I can try out enums. I don't think it'll make a difference, but it's something different to try. <laughs> I don't know if the, the compiler can optimize these more because it knows an enum is going to be like an int type, or I guess if you're debugging, these would show up as valid symbols so you could see them better. Maybe that maybe it would be better to use enums instead of defines everywhere. So I, I don't know. Um, you can't really, you can redefine defines later, I think, as well. So I put another define down here for max file name length. I think it could change. In enums, you can't do that. So that's a little better. But these do take up memory space. Um, I was going to put the little ATAPIO commands in here. So read with retry would be 20. 
And then right with retry is 30. That's what I'm going to do. Need a comma. Okay, and these are ATAPIO commands. That's fine. So I call them to stop. Um, but yeah, I th these can't really be redefined. And I think these symbols will show up if I use them. So if I'm debugging, I can search for this or I can look for this and it'll show up as read with retry. It won't just say 20 in hex, which is 32. But those are used down here like in, in delete file, write with retry. This command is 30. And if I'm reading like in load file, we have a read with retry, which is 20. So, you know, that's why I named these. That's what the commands are. But OK, I'll have another sort of function here. This function will basically be for reading and writing disk sectors. So to read, write sectors to from disk um, using an ETA PIO. I'll have a few inputs that I'll put with this. We'll have file size and sectors, uh, the starting sector. And the file table entry, well, both of these will come from that, actually. <laughs> file size from the file table entry, the starting sector from the file table entry, address to, uh, say, read or write data from to, <laughs> so an address, and the command to do or the command to perform should be reading or writing. <laughs> and the command will be, you know, one of these, the read with retry or write with retry. So if I want to do other commands later, I can add them to this enum. That should be fine. I'm just going to make it a void. I can change that later if I want to return an error code or something. Um, so read write sectors, RW sectors, I'll just call it. Make these constants. So we have the file size and sectors. So I'll have I guess it'll just be sectors, I don't know. Or size in sectors, maybe that makes more sense. Size in sectors. Um, the starting sector, which right now is a byte, I could increase this though later as needed. Starting sector. Actually, that one I'm not making a constant. Because uh, I'm going to use that within calculation to determine the correct cylinder head sector values like I did in the boot sector earlier. Um, I'm in 32-bit mode, so the max and address can be is 32 bits right now, so we'll still do that, a number for that. And the command we want to run, okay. And like that CHS code I had in the boot sector, I'm going to have a head and cylinder value. We're already given a sector, so I'll just keep that, but I'll add in an, an additional head and cylinder values here. Um, and I'm going to have a test byte. Or a working variable. Um, so that is for like in our, you know, delete or load or save functions, what have you, we have this test byte and that I'm using for just to check until the busy bit is clear or maybe for other things. So that's what that's going to be for because I'm going to, you know, extract this logic up here. Um, but before I extract the logic, I'm going to get the right CHS values. Convert given starting sector to correct CHS values. So since I started these off as zero, we only have to translate it if the given sector is above 63, because it's the max for a sector is 63. So we're only going to mess with this if the starting sector is above 63. And then if we want to check later on if the cylinder is above a limit, we can do that. But we'll have like an error or something there, but error for disk limit reached. Okay, I guess greater than 1023, rather. Or greater than equal to 10, whatever makes more sense. Greater than equal 1024 is fine. Well, but I'm not worried about that. So if we have above 63, we need to translate that. So like I did in the boot sector, which I guess I could pull up here. And load sectors, if it's above 63, I want to divide by 63 and mod it. 
for the sector number. So I'm going to do that. So the head is going to be the sector divided by 63. And the sector itself will be moduloed by 63. So I'll set it equal to itself mod 63. If that equals zero, that means we're on a 63 sector boundary. Uh, in which case I'm going to set it to 63 and we'll reduce the head number because that would be the last sector on the previous head. So if the sector is 63, then head is not going to be one, head is going to be zero since sector 63 is the last one on head zero, that edge case. But after we get the right sector and head number, I'll get the cylinder number, which is head divided by 16. And then the correct head number is head modulo 16. Um, which I think I did explain maybe kind of badly, but I did explain earlier as I was writing the boot sector code, which does. So this is the same thing, but in C pretty much. But yeah, but this limit. And then later on, if I want to change the LBA, I'm just going to put that here. Because that would be easier to work with. <laughs> change the LBA later on. Uh, either 28, 48-bit LBA. And then I'm going to have formulas here. So I have them somewhere in my code. Um, but you can, you can convert between LBA and CHS pretty easily, just with a little formulas, little algorithms here. So a cylinder head sector to LBA. If you're given a CHS, a cylinder head and a sector number, and you want to get the LBA, that's relatively simple. Take the cylinder multiplied by 16 plus the head number. And you multiply that by 63. That's how many sectors are on a head. Then you add the sector number and subtract one. So it's cylinder times head per cylinder plus the head number. And that expression multiplied by sectors per head. And that expression added to the sector number and then subtract one. Because LBA is zero based, sectors are one based. That's why you do this extra minus one at the end. Um, LBA to CHS is slightly more involved, but that's okay. Cylinder is, if we're given an LBA number, logical block address, and we want to get the CHS numbers from that, which I might do or have to do later, um, to get the cylinder value, you take your LBA number, divide it by the heads per cylinder multiplied by the sectors per head, or 16 times 63 for this example. Um, we'll have a temp variable. It's going to be the LBA modulo. You know, the head per cylinder in the sectors per head, so 16 times 63. The head number is going to be temp divided by 63. And the sector number would be temp modulo 63 plus one, because it's one based. So it's, it's still, it's pretty easy to convert back and forth. So I might have to do that later, so I'll just put it there. So somewhere has it in my code. <laughs> okay, and then, here, I'm going to actually abstract the logic, the disk reading logic, this stuff here. Okay, I'll just take this to start off with. This is for writing. Well, it'll be slightly different for reading, but this stuff down here is all going to be for writing pretty much. Take all that, yank it out. I'll get rid of this stuff later, but I'll do this first. Or actually, you know what I'm going to do is keep that. So I know what to remove later. <laughs> I'll just copy it and not, not delete it. Okay, copy that. I have a little different explanation for the drive number, so I'm going to put that here. Port 1F6 and hex the head drive number port. So the bits, uh, bit seven is always set or one. Bit six is for cylinder head sector if it's clear or LBA if set. Bit five is always set, which is one. Bit four is the drive number. 
0 equals primary, 1 equals secondary. Okay, and bits 3 to 0 or 0 to 3 are the head number, because it's 0 to 15, which fits in 4 bits. 0, 1, 2, 3. If that helps explain things a little bit more, that's why the head drive number, the primary is A, which is 10, which would be bits 5 and 7, <laughs> which are always set. Let's see, A, A0 would be 1010, yeah, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 7. So yeah, those are always set by default. Uh, the primary drive would be in bit 4. We're using the primary drive. CHS addressing is bit 6, so that's why that's clear. If this was set, we'd be using LBA, but we're not. We'll get the head number ORed in these first three. So. How do we do that? I'm going to change A. Instead of drive, I'm going to put A0. And we're just going to OR that with the head number. The head number that we got up here, the correct head number 0 to 15, we're going to OR that with A0 for the primary drive. Bit 5 and 7 are always set. And that'll give us the right bit to set to this port, 1F6. I can also use the in and out byte functions that I have in the ports.h, or io.h file rather. But I'll use those after I confirm that this works, just because this is how it's currently laid out. Um, the size and sectors we want to send over is going to be, I guess, the size and sectors that we passed in, so that's simple enough. Number of sectors we want to read. The starting sector is going to be our starting sector. Cylinder low and high, so our cylinder is a word value, even though it's not going to be a word value from our disk limits right now. It might be long. It might be later after some other changes. So uh, the low value would be cylinder anded with the low 8 bits. And the high value will be cylinder shifted right by 8 and then anded with the lower 8 bits. So I'll put that there. Okay, and then whatever command we want to send is the command that we sent in to this function, which is only going to be 20 or 30 here for read or write with retry. So we'll send the command that we sent in to the command port. Uh, send read write command. Okay, and I think that looks good. That's all we should have to do. So this is for writing that I did right here, but reading comes first. So I'm going to have just a little if statement here. If we have a bunch of commands later, I'll, you know, this can be a switch or what have you, but I'll just have a little if else to start off. If command is read with retry, then we'll do some code else, have an else if, else if command is write. Write with retry, then we'll do this stuff, because this is for writing. So that's why I have this test byte, you know, U and 8 there, because we're going to be using test byte here to test if the bit is clear. So overriding A with that value read from the status register. Um, we're writing out, we're not necessarily going to be writing to 1000 here, this is a generic function. So instead of 1000, this will be whatever address we pass in. That's why that is the, the parameter there. Writing to this address, or writing from this address, rather. <laughs> 256 words from this. Okay. So in the cache flush after we're done, that's fine. I, I should convert, you know, the port numbers, the magic numbers and stuff to defines or enums. Maybe later, but that should work for writing, hopefully. So we go down to delete, and we get everything. And we're writing here, because this is where I copied the code from. I should be able to remove this. And write 
an old data too should be there. Okay. And put in a call to that function. Which I put above check file name, which is fine. Forgot about that. I thought check file name was first. So I'm going to move that first in the file because that's how the test was set up. So not to make things confusing, but I want that to be first. That's how I had it before when it was working. Okay. So this takes in read, write sectors, takes in the size and sectors, which if we're writing the file table, then that'll be file size, or will that be FT size? The starting sector will be FT start sector. The address to read and write to will be 1000. We're writing the file table. That's the file table address. And the command will be write with retry. Okay, so we converted however much code that was to one call, which doesn't matter because we have another call, so it's not reducing code yet, but that's okay. So this we're filling out null data, and then we need to write the zeroed out data to disk. So I'll do that with another call to our read write sectors. Except this will be file size. As it was, I'm just copying basically what I have down here. So file size, it'll be starting sector. The address is going to be 20,000, right? Yeah, 0x 20,000. It's just a null data location, and this will be right with retry. So we shouldn't need any of this anymore because it'll do all that stuff. Although, yeah, we do need to eventually return like an error or not. That would be good. Worry about that later, I guess. Assuming it's one sector, don't need to worry about that. Because we're getting the right sector for that up here. Okay. That will make delete file look a little bit smaller, a bit smaller, a bit better. We don't need test byte in here. I'm not using drive num. Our drive is going to be zero until we say otherwise. Um, error code we're not using anymore in delete file. These four we are free space. We are file table. File pointer I don't think we are, are we? Yeah. That's fine. Okay. Okay, so that's fine. A little extra variables here we don't need, like, you know, setting these. I could directly set file pointer offset 14 and 15 in place of the size and sector here, right? We don't need to set those since we're using it in this other function now. That's okay. That is for delete file. So what? Uh, just to test that out right quick, I'll see if that compiles or not, which it, it doesn't. Um, college object type character two is not a function or function pointer. All the object type, interesting. Not a function or function pointer. Oh, oh, yeah. What I'm doing here. See, I, I did, there's double parentheses here. I need one set of parentheses. That's, that's not good. That ain't right. Because otherwise that's saying this whole expression here, nope, I just need that for A. And then D is that one, and then the whole thing is this one, yeah. Typos, always got to make those. Okay. So if delete works, then hopefully we're good. Uh, oh, I have a bunch of stuff in there. I have some things duplicated. Now that's weird. Let's see what happened there. That doesn't have all the duplicated ones. Okay, that should be fine. <laughs> okay, I don't know what that issue was, but whatever, it's, <laughs> it's fixed. Just remake it. Um, okay, so if I go to delete, let's delete test font again. 
okay, well then this whole thing doesn't show up. That's good. Well, it's not good, but so the file table doesn't show up at all now. Okay, is it just because of the delete? No. Oh yeah, reboot doesn't work. Um. Okay, if we reboot effectively and then do it, then it is deleted correctly, but the file table did not show up right for whatever reason. Which, what is directory call? Print file table? Maybe I can look at that. And it calls load file, okay. Which works the same way. I don't think that's an issue. We didn't change that code. What did I do here? I wrote the file table size and start sector to address 1000. I don't know why that messed up, so I don't like that. But, you know, we can convert the other things because delete actually did work. So maybe if I change load file to call this function, it'll work more consistent. Hopefully, I don't know, but hopefully, but we'll see. Uh, okay, so we're getting the file size and starting sector again. So this is for read with retry. So this will be code that I abstract out to that other function. I'm just going to delete that, which is not great. I should have left it in, but that's okay. It should be similar to this stuff we already have, but I'll... Um, Put it under put it under read with retry to make sure. Indent that. So these all would be effectively the same. We're getting the drive number, sending it there. We're getting the size, starting sector, whatever these numbers are in the command. So the command we pass in will be 20 or 30, so we don't need this anymore. But read with retry will read in. Test by it, wait until the busy bit is clear, which is the same code as we have here. Interesting. That might could be deduplicated. Um, I'm reading into an address already, so that's good. And then we're reading an alternate status register. Yeah, so that's I actually don't have to change any of this, I don't think. Which is which is nice. Read with retry is a little bit easier to set up. But I'll check the error register after any of these. Yeah, which I already have that to do for that. Okay, so we'll change load file to call read write sectors, see if it works any better, any differently. So that'll be here. I'll put I'll put this uh, comment back in actually. Read sectors using ATAPIO. Okay, this will be read write sectors, our new function. Starting sector size will be file size. Um, since we're setting that, instead of just putting file size here. We can just put, you know, this. This would be the same thing right now. So number of sectors to read is the size, the sector we want to start reading at. It's file pointer 14. Um, the address we want to read is, you know, already passed in. And the command will be read with retry. Yeah, be read with retry. So we don't have to do these, which is nice. Don't need the test by, we do need file pointer, don't need drive or error code or what well, we do need return code. File size we're not using anymore, don't need that. Starting sector I'm not using anymore. The load file will be a lot smaller now, which is good. Um, rename and save I need to change, but again, I'll do a little incremental testing here. See if I failed at stuff or not, like I did. H8825, use of undeclared identifier file size. Okay, 88. This one, I equals file size. This would be however many sectors we need to read, right? So this will be size in sectors. Should be size in sectors. It is nice not having to change, you know, the sector sizes anymore. I made a keybind, you know, to center the window, but I made it control alt C and control alt X kills the window. So if you see me bring something up and then do that without meaning to, it's because I meant to hit C and not X. 
So it's not great putting those next to each other, but I like centering the window. So anyway, I also don't know why making it and redoing this does this. I guess if it has an error, whatever the error was, if I do make it, it doesn't clear out the os.bin file, just cats it to the end again. So I don't know, but. We remove it and make it again. Should be okay. <laughs> and we do know load file is working because file table, to print this, it calls load file. But if we want to prove that it's working, I can also, you know, call a program, which will call load file, load it. We program it. Um, or we run the program and load existing file. This will also load a file. So load file is working, so that's good. So delete and load file work. Except when I delete something, the file table disappears for some reason. I need to figure out why that is, because that is not good. But if we delete it and rerun it, then I know the delete worked. So I still don't like that that happens, though. I got to look into that. Um, there's two more functions in here to change rename file and save file. Right, delete was changed, load was changed, rename file, um, which we'll just change where we write the file table to disk. We'll just change this stuff here to our read write sectors, be the file table size, the file table start sector. Uh, the address for the file table is going to be 1000, like we have down here. And this will be right with retry. So we don't have to do this disk writing code, which is nice. Don't need the test by, don't need that, um, don't need the error code. File pointer, don't even really need to set these again, <laughs> but I'll keep them there and use them. That's fine. So that's rename file, save file. I can change as well, but let's see if rename works. Let me make clean first. Just to remove the other stuff in the file table, just in case. Okay, so if I rename test font to font test. It says font test, okay. So renaming and then displaying the file table is okay. But deleting is not. So it seems to be localized to deleting where that weird bug is. Am I doing anything differently in here that I'm not noticing? Probably. Should be okay. Well, we're writing from 20,000. This is going to be in memory. The, the address we're writing from, rather. So we changed the file table, which is starting at 1,000, and we're writing that to disk. So I think this is somehow messing up, or one of these is. Don't know. Hmm. Oh, well. <laughs> I will figure it out. I just don't want to do it right now and take up too much time. So last, the last thing we can change here is save file, which I know I never did these to-dos. I, I guess they'll stay out there forever. <laughs> Um, which is okay, but all we're doing is changing where we're actually writing to the disk here. Get rid of that to do because we're getting the actual size. So write the file table to disk. The file table size, file table start sector, address 1000, write with retry. We don't have to do this or this. Am I waiting until the bit is clear after a cache flush? I am writing the cache flush command. I'm not sure I'm waiting until it's clear. Let me copy that. Mm, I'm not. Let me do that. I, I don't really need to do this, but since I had it in one function and not the other, I feel weird if it's not there. So I'll just put that there where I'm writing. After the cache flush command, I'll just wait till it's clear after that. I don't know if that'll fix a bug or not, but <laughs> it was in this code, so I guess I'll, I'll put it in there. 
this is what I changed. Okay, so get rid of this. Handle disk error. Yeah, we need to handle error later. So write file table or file data to disk will be another call to read write sectors using the end file size, the last save sector. Um, what address did we, we probably just passed it in, right? Yeah. Address. And write with retry again. So we don't have to do this stuff. And we have a shorter file now, 346 lines. I think it was over 400 before, but if not, it, at least these functions are smaller. They're simplified now. Basically just replacing where, where we were writing with, you know, a call to that other function, which is fine. We're using that free space file table. Yeah. Test byte, not using, get rid of that. Okay. So load, save, delete, rename. Should all be working. Everything should work exactly as it did before. That's just kind of abstracted now. And if we had any issues with sector numbers being real high, that should load hopefully a little bit better since we'd be getting now the correct head, if not cylinder numbers as well. Hopefully. So I can see if saving worked by, you know, making a file in the editor. Didn't get anything back, which is good. Test file one here is at the end. That means saving worked, so that is nice. And directory works there. So if I delete test file one, okay, then the file table still shows up. If I delete test font, if I delete test font, it disappears. That's interesting. Maybe if I delete something that isn't last on the disk, it breaks. I don't know why that would be true, but... Or there's some weird code with deleting, which seems more likely to be the case. I guess rename I can check, right? Although I did check and that seemed to work. So it, they all do work. It's just deleting has some issues. I'm wondering, is that anything in the kernel? I don't think it would be, but maybe it is. I'm not sure, but the leading at the end of the list did work, so that's interesting. So we can see now if any of these other flags work for optimization, if it works, yeah. That was kind of what I was trying to fix. If these numbers are gonna be really big, then they would run over 63 sectors. You know, for some of the later stuff, like the editor and calculator. You know, these are gonna be over 63, well, yeah, these are going to be over 63, so. Which I think was the issue with it not loading before. See, now this loads. So it should be getting the right head and sector number now. So that's why the calculator loads now, and the editor should um, load as well. Yeah. We should be able to save. Save a new file at the end. Yeah, renaming works. Um... I'm just really, what if I try deleting something else, like term use 16 in? Interesting. Delete test file. Run it again. The so delete test file did not go through, so it was overriding. Whenever I delete something, I think it's overriding the 1000 memory space with like nulls. Except when it's at the end of the list. I'll look and see why that is, but um, it does work now, at least on other, you know, dash O numbers. I don't think O3 works, but maybe it does. Because that'll make things, that'll make things really large. <laughs> 70, 47, 1F. It's huge. These files are down here, but we, stood be, we should still be able, yeah, to load things, which is good. Okay, and the other stuff works like the, like the exceptions, yeah, okay. So that's good, that works. Does it work in box? Box is a little bit more of a stickler about things, which is good, it should be. 
It's loading some things. <laughs> Box is a little weird. So this this happened when I was testing as well. Um, the colors don't load. Stuff is still here, but the colors don't load. So um, that was a, an attempt to write the directory. If I try to load the calculator, some stuff shows up, but you know the colors aren't set. So if I do one divided by zero in the calculator, this still shows up, but the main text um, is not set, obviously. But I can change that. Try to fix that in the kernel where I set the initial colors. I'm going to wrap this in a while loop, and it'll be while. Uh, basically, the foreground and background colors are set to, you know, black or null or whatever. It's all zeros. So I'm just going to check while the foreground color is zero. Or even I could do while not foreground color. Should be equivalency. Equivalency. <laughs> um... Then we'll try to convert, and when it's set, this will not be true, and we'll go on. So that should fix box. That shouldn't affect anything. No member name foreground color. Uh, okay. Oh, it's not graphics mode. It's um, user graphics info. Yeah, user. User graphics info foreground color. Okay. I might have to make clean again to fix the file table issue. And this is dash 03 still. So yeah, it takes longer and those are big. Um, again, and QEMU won't change anything. And yeah, I still have that issue with the file table. So I'll just do that. But we'll see if box actually shows the colors now. So this is just a little bit of uh, bug hunting, bug fixing for box. Make sure that works again. Okay. So box, ooh, it doesn't like setting the colors. That's interesting. Floating point unit exceptions. It should set it here and then check. I don't think it would be a flag issue either, but I'll check that. Check it with a different flag to be sure. Okay, I guess it was a flag issue. So dash 03 with box did not work. Dash 01 seems to have worked. Although we don't have anything available, <laughs> which is not great. That's interesting. The memory is, is crap on this some reason only 117 blocks free that's just that that's weird but um, another issue on box even if this does work and it does um the escape key on my keyboard doesn't work for box for some reason so if i want the calculator to work in box i'll have to fix that because escape is also caps lock so what i'm going to do for that is instead of escape i'm going to also allow or maybe only allow um, control r to go back to the kernel, similar to the editor in the text file, it's going to be control R to exit. So that's why I'm putting an R here in the valid input in the calculator. And also the clear screen for the background doesn't need to be convert. It just needs to be the background color. So it will already have been converted before this point. So that was a bug too. So get a key. I added a key to valid input, so this will be 20. So if it is escape, I'll do or, the characters R. I guess if I want to do control R, it would be control, which is in keyboard. Is that returned? Yeah, the global address, so left control. Um, so that's at 1603. And I have get key here. I might just put like a pointer to that, <laughs> to be honest. Um, I'm just going to call it control. I will clean this up when I do an actual keyboard interrupt um, request number, IRQ1 from the pick. This will be a little different, I think, but it's still a little bit sloppy for the keyboard code. But right now, this bad magic hard-coded number. 
going to be this. Zero if not. Okay. Or I could just get the value. Well, the value will change. So that's why it's a pointer. Yeah, okay. That way I can check if... And I could just do regular R, not control R, but... If the value at control is pressed, then that'll be on. And if they pressed R, then it should be control R, I think. I think that makes sense. Then we'll return. So let's just see. Oh no. Yeah, I don't put a semicolon at the end. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Got my other work brain going where you do do that, but we don't do that in C. If I go to the calculator, if I do control R, it goes back. So that's good. That way we can escape within box. We go to the calculator. Control R. Takes a while, but now we can go free it at address 14,000. That's interesting too, because I only set it up to C000. But there's other stuff in memory taking up some stuff, huh? In box. Or the returned memory is, is weird. Oh, control alt Q was in QEMU. This one you have to do. Control alt X. Uh okay. But we do have I mean, at this point, there is a bug with delete that I have to work out, but we have the optimization flags here. You can you don't have to do OZ only for Clang anymore. You can do dash OS. Or, do, or a one or two or three, although three can be a little iffy. I think OG for debugging should work as well. I think the only thing that wasn't working was some things with um, no optimizations. Dash O zero. Everything else should work for calling programs and everything. So I'll double check that again. I'm pretty sure dash O zero did not work. Or I'm lying to you. No, yeah, dash o zero doesn't work, so that doesn't work. Um, another thing related to that, because <laughs> this video is just going to go on for five hours now, because I keep remembering bugs that I have. <laughs> there is a bug within string in copy, or string in compare, rather. And that is where I'm getting uh, basically what's um, the file extension. When I'm calling load file, I'm returning a file extension. Somewhere in here I'm getting a file, yeah, I'm getting a file extension. So I'm checking if that file extension that is returned is text or bin or what have you. If it's BIN, then I'm loading a program. If it's not BIN, I'm not loading a program. And that is from a string in compare check, which is also what all these commands are checking in the kernel. Um, but I have a bug in here. I have an off by one error, if you can find it. And that, you know, we increment I, we increment the pointers themselves. If we have two pointers that are BIN and then a null, like, that's fine, right? But I'm incrementing these up to three times if I pass in a three, and then I'm returning the data at string one minus the data at string two. So I'm returning past the end of the string that I'm checking, though. If, if, string, one, if string one and string two were both BIN, then effectively I'm going forward three times, and I'm into, like, a null space. But that's assuming there's a null here. For the file extension, it's only three characters. There is no null. It could be anything. I think usually it would be, um, it'd probably be this B, to be honest with you, because that's right after here in memory. So if it's set up contiguously when it's compiled, then it would be this. Um, or it would wrap around. I'm not sure how the, the compiler handles that case. But if I want to fix that off by one error reading into memory, I can, I can do that. Um, and that'll make this, uh, well, I guess not really simpler, but slightly different. I'm going to change the length here from a constant. And I'm going to get rid of i. And I'm going to check while length is greater than zero. And these two match. Well, and string one. Um, well, we can check if it exists, I guess. That would do it to start off. Or I can just check if they're equal. If it doesn't exist, then, you know, if they're both zero, they'd be equal anyway. 
I guess I can still increment these, um, but I can decrement length. And then at the end, if length is zero, or I can do not length, but I'll have if length is zero, I'm going to return zero. Otherwise, you know, I'm going to return string one minus string two. I'll put that over. I'll line these up, I guess. So that way, if we're given two strings, like the file extension and a string bin to check if it's bin, and a length of three, it'll see if the b's are equal. That's true. It'll increment them both to i. The length will go down from three to two. The i's are equal. You know, those will go to the n. The length will be one. The n's are equal. Those, these will go on. And the length will go down to zero. So if the length is zero, then we'll return zero. We won't return data from the strings being compared because they will, I guess those will still be off by one actually, which is not great, but we're not returning the data at those at least. <laughs> so one of these string one or string two could be off by one at the end of this, but at least we're not getting the data there. But that's still bad. I should probably change it to where you, you can't do that. Maybe later, but that'll fix a little bug there. That shouldn't change anything because I want to return a zero if they're equal. So I should still be able to load files. Maybe, maybe not. I guess I can't. <laughs> maybe I can't load files. That's good. Because nothing happened. But that was what I was talking about. So before I did that, O0 worked. That's interesting. I'm pretty sure O0 did not work before when I was testing. I think all the other, all the other flags should work. If I go to load something, you know, that works. Exceptions are good. I should have like a test server suite set up so I can test all these compiler flags. But dash O of one works. Um, dash O two should work. Yeah. Dash O of S, you know, and O of Z should work. Dash O three should work. I'll keep it on dash OS just for, you know, a compromise here to save on size. But it should work within QEMU inbox. Uh, I'll just check. And yeah, it works. Okay, so dash O zero doesn't work. I don't know why it doesn't work. It's, it's news to me. I don't know why. <laughs> um, but we can automatically build the OS, which is good, at least with Clang. GCC, this doesn't compile because of weird floating point issues with um, interrupt service routines. I don't use floating point, but it, you have to specify you need to use only certain registers, I think. So GCC doesn't compile. But if you're using Clang, at least stuff works on this setup <laughs> under multiple compiler flags here. And the reason I had FPIE earlier was due to other OSs I was testing on, like FreeBSD. Which a lot of what that does is make relative addresses instead of absolute addresses, which would change how programs are called, like calculator or editor. This should still work under FPIE, and it does. Should work under box as well, I'll just make sure. Because eventually I want to test this under different environments, right? So it'd be good if stuff worked under different environments and was consistent. So this is better portability. And I fixed a couple bugs. This is weird that Box has like crap for memory though. That's interesting. I think one last thing before I go. <laughs> so yeah, this video is like four hours long. That's, that's all right. One last thing before I go. Um, since reboot currently causes issues... You know, we have an exception, FFFC, um, whatever that is, I got to look that up. That might be a protection fault or something. Um, we can change how reboot is done, actually, which I don't know if it's supported on all platforms or not, but instead of just jumping to the reset vector, there was, at least at one time, maybe still be true, um, you can send a command to the keyboard controller, PS2, that is. Um, you can send to, to the keyboard controller port, 64. Um, you can send the command fe, and what this is, what this will do is, uh, it's a reset CPU command, pretty much. 
I think it's called reset CPU. I'll put it in double quotes so you don't take me too literal. Send reset CPU command to keyboard controller ports. I think this is PS2 keyboard controller, but what that should do is send a reset command and reset. Reboot the PC. It should send a, a reset command and do the equivalent of rebooting. I think it's a warm reboot, not a cold reboot. But it should, it should work how it was before. We should get back to this screen where we put in stuff. But we don't get, you know, an, an exception does not occur anymore. And then we're like, okay, we can reset our video modes and everything's fine. We can go back and do whatever we were doing. Um, you know, load our stuff. But now that works, and that should also work within Box. I don't have a shutdown command for Box, but at least the reboot should work. We do have our new file at the end. That's good. So that's good. We can reboot within Box now and QEMU. Once again, by sending a reset CPU command to the controller port. And that is nice. But eventually I'll need a shutdown for Box. But okay, this video has gone on long enough, I'm sure. <laughs> um, the important thing is that I'm going to keep FPIE because I'll, I'll probably show it separately in another video. But this, this does allow it, for whatever reason, allows things to run a little bit better on other OSs, at least FreeBSD that I was testing on. For this video, we can auto-build the OS and... We can use multiple compiler flags if you want to mess with optimization levels for things. Even if they take up a bunch more sectors, we fixed the getting sort of head cylinder values, sector values, given a starting sector. So even if these are really big in the file table, then we're still able to load and run things correctly on QEMU and Box, even if it takes a second. We're still able to load and run things correctly. And I can reboot and I fix the string in compare bugs. So the only flag for whatever reason that this does not work on for me is dash o zero but i'll take before it was only dash oz so i'll take working on everything but o zero over only one flag <laughs> regardless and when i say work i mean actually able to load and run programs from the kernel even if they're really slow and that is because i did o zero yeah so o zero for some reason doesn't work for loading stuff we fixed some bugs and we can auto load and test everything but O0. I'm going to keep it on OS personally, just for size savings. Okay, this will be a little short um, additional segment here to show that I did fix the delete operation, that bug that was happening where the file table wouldn't appear after you deleted something that wasn't the last entry in the file table. So I'm just going to go over that here. It's just a quick one line change because uh, I forgot something. I always forget something. So. When we're writing with retry in this read write sectors function here, reading was okay, but if we're writing, I did not have anything for the number of sectors that we were going to write from. It was defaulted to just one sector. It was this. It was this, basically. Just one sector. <laughs> so what I did was just multiply the 256, the number of words we're going to write, by the size and sectors that is passed in originally. So the first parm here. Um, reading was okay because I'm in, it's within a for loop for the number of sectors we're going to read. So it reads one and then goes back, reads the next, so on. Uh, writing was only writing one at a time. That's not really great. So I think the issue with the delete was that if we deleted something that was more than one sector, it would fill up, you know, the 20,000 in hex memory area with however many sectors of zeros, but it would only end up writing one of those sectors, even though we set up in this to write more than one sector. So I think it was just like stopping short. And then the next read or write operation, like maybe it took what was left on the bus to write or read because it was more than one sector. I'm not really sure, but this, this change fixes it. Just change the 256 to 256 multiplied by the size and sectors. And that should write all of the sectors now and not just one. But I can go ahead and show that. Because before... Before, if we deleted something like test font and we did this, it wouldn't show up. And now it does. Hey, look at that. Free space. Bam. So that's pretty good. So that just that just fixes the, the whole delete thing there. And I can rename, you know, stuff that's all right. 
I don't know if I want to. I can rename the kernel to kern. Might as well. It doesn't really matter. But you can rename and delete stuff in the middle of the list. It works now. Just a short thing to show that, hey, you got to actually write all the sectors if you want to write all the sectors. <laughs> but that's all right. Anyway, again, thanks for watching. Next episode will probably be over PIC, Programmable Interrupt Controller Interrupts. Probably, probably Interrupt Request Zero for the Programmable Interval Timer. Just keep an account of PIT ticks. And then maybe IRQ1 for the keyboard, changing the get key code, putting most of that within the IRQ function instead of within the current get key. Kind of moving that, changing that a bit so we don't have to just pull the data port repeatedly. We might still be polling, but hopefully with less CPU use using halt or something. And then IRQ8 to get date time from the CMOS real-time clock, just because I think that's kind of cool. We can show the, the date time using flags for QEMU or box to set the real-time clock appropriately for the emulation, but that'll probably be on the next one. After that, I might try to work on an assembler, do virtual memory paging or something else. Not really sure. If you have anything specific you want me to do or work on or look at, let me know. I'll try to do it if time permits. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching again. Appreciate it, and I'll see you on the next one. Thank you.